On the beautiful spring morning of May 21, 1933, a gaggle of friends and several members of the press gathered on the runway of the London Aeroplane Club at Stag Lane Aerodrome, north of London. The occasion was to witness Maurice Wilson take off in his self-modified biplane named the Ever Rest and to begin the first leg of his mission to inspire the world and be the first person to stand upon the summit of Mount Everest. Maurice had come through some dark times, but the mission he set for himself to inspire the world was in itself life-threatening. The small crowd lining the runway that day was not exactly an energized cheering section. The press was there out of curiosity, and his friends were there for moral support and to wish him safe travels, which was really questionable given his skill set. Maurice didn't consider his plan to be particularly dangerous. In his mind, the journey presented some risks, but the risks were not quite beyond the dangerous situations he'd already survived in his life. Growing up in the early 1900s and working from a young age, fighting through the most deadly battles of World War I, fighting through the darkness of depression, failed marriages, traveling the earth looking for a place he could call home, was flying this little biplane and landing somewhere on the slopes of the highest mountain on earth and then hiking to the summit of the mountain really so dangerous? Maurice was carrying a revitalized attitude about life and an unwavering faith, and that he was sure would see him through any truly difficult or dangerous situation. So on that bright spring morning in May 1933, Maurice fired up the single engine of the Everest and began to rumble down the grass runway. The plane was acting a bit strangely, but Maurice thought it might have been his own nerves or the extra weight in the plane from all his gear. But what he had not realized at that moment was he was going down the runway in the wrong direction. The plane rattled through the air and fought to gain enough speed to take off. Towards the end of the runway, the biplane managed to get airborne just a bit. The wings flexed and the plane started rattling and it clawed its way into the sky. Seeing the struggle from the ground and now realizing what had happened, Maurice's friends in the press wondered if they would ever see Maurice Wilson again. He was attracting a lot of attention and he was becoming famous, but would he end up infamous? The inauspicious start to this journey seemed to indicate that infamy might be a more likely outcome. If you have a friend that's determined to take on a dangerous adventure, do you feel compelled to warn them of the dangers? or perhaps even try to prevent them from taking on that adventure? Would it make any difference if the person seemed qualified and determined? Is it your place to warn friends of obvious dangers, or are you really just doing it so you can feel better about yourself later if something goes wrong? Are you actually reserving the right to say, I tried to warn him, I told him it was a bad idea, I knew it wasn't going to work? And if you say those things, does that completely absolve you of responsibility? That's tough to answer. Would it make a difference if the person was qualified and competent at the task, regardless of the danger? I've known and continue to be friends with adventure athletes or what some people call extreme athletes. There's a big difference between an extreme athlete and a person with a desire to do extreme activities. Experience to me seems to be the main thing that separates them. I've known people that have been seriously and permanently injured and others who have been killed while participating in extreme sports. But did I ever caution them not to do something they had a desire to do? No, I wouldn't. Everyone I know who participates in extreme activities is well qualified to take on those challenges. Experience does minimize the danger, but does it eliminate it? The difference is if someone is completely unqualified and ill-equipped to take on an extreme activity, they are essentially, in my opinion, killing themselves. If they survive, it's an unbelievable stroke of luck. But the odds are, they will die. Conversely, if an extreme athlete who's trained much of their life for this moment and goes in with the skill to succeed, but with the understanding that they could get seriously hurt or killed, then that's a totally different equation. The inexperienced suffer from that old saying, they don't know what they don't know, which means they don't really fully comprehend the danger and risk of their actions. The experienced extreme athlete has taken an educated and calculated risk. That experience does, in fact, mitigate at least some of the risk. If you got in a car and drove to the store, you probably put on your seatbelt because you know there's a risk of a crash, and you could get killed. If you have no experience driving, or with automobiles at all, 
and you chose to drive to the store, it probably wouldn't even occur to you to put on a seatbelt. You wouldn't have any experience or knowledge of the importance of the seatbelt. So if you get in an accident and get killed, it wouldn't be a surprise to those who knew you. Maurice Wilson had friends that worried about him. They worried about his mental state, about the 15 years of darkness that seemed to consume him. They worried about his lack of experience in both aviation and mountaineering. But he'd overcome a lot, and he endured what most people have nightmares about. In the end, his friends did send him off with enthusiastic caution and an understandable amount of worry. In this episode, we'll look at the origins of Maurice's issues and the courage he demonstrated throughout his life, and how those experiences were the preparation for one of the greatest adventures of the 20th century. My name is Jeff Varge, and this is the High Adventure Podcast. Hello and welcome to episode two of season two of the High Adventure podcast. In episode one, we introduced you to Maurice Wilson, a World War I vet who'd suffered both physical and mental injury during his time in those trenches of France. And today we're going to talk further about this motivation to fly his self-modified biplane, known as the Everest, from England and head into Tibet and onto the slopes of Mount Everest. This kickoff to the new season has been a lot of fun. Our listener base has increased, and we've added several new countries to the list of locations that have already become part of our audience. We're up to nearly 80 countries that have folks listening to this show. If you're one of those folks and you're enjoying these stories, please leave a review for us on whatever podcast platform or app you listen on. And please, please tell your friends and share the podcast on your social media sites. You can email me at thehighadventurepodcast at gmail.com, and you can find us on Twitter at, at High Adventure Podcast, or on Facebook at The High Adventure Podcast, and on Instagram at High Adventure Podcast. Along with the podcast platforms, we always post these episodes on both YouTube and Vimeo channels. Those channels can be found under our company name of Accidental Productions. Also on those channels, you can find lots of other content that we've produced over the years, and a lot more is coming this year. So please subscribe and stay tuned, as they used to say. In the previous episode, we discussed Maurice Wilson's career in the military, including the injuries and the medals he earned for valor. Maurice was part of the 146th Infantry Brigade, which was known within the armed forces in England as the PBI, or the Poor Bloody Infantry. Their routine during the battle in the war was simple. They spent four days in the front line, followed by four days clearing the trenches of debris and dead bodies, laying barbed wire, repairing sandbags, and open walls of the trenches. And that was followed by four days of rest, but that was only if they weren't needed to reinforce the fighting. It was a never-ending cycle. We also talked about Maurice's decision to try to inspire the world with a dramatic physical achievement. We learned that he'd consulted some type of mystic who'd advised him on a regime of fasting and contemplation, both of which Maurice would credit for changing his life. After 30 days of fasting, followed by weeks in the Black Forest of Germany, Maurice emerged as a different man. Or did he? Was it the Black Forest of Germany that changed him, or was it the trenches of France that did it? It seems that Maurice Wilson may have changed a few times in his life. He'd survived every challenge ever put before him. So why would this be different? In the mind of Maurice, this was no different. But in the minds of nearly everyone else, this was different. But those folks didn't know or really understand what Maurice had gone through in his life up to that point. Of course, what was visible was obvious. The depression, the moving from place to place, the strained relationships. But what was happening inside the mind of Maurice Wilson? No one could possibly know what was going on in Maurice's mind, at least not until much later when his diary was found. And thanks to a bit of digging in some very obscure places, I found a copy of Maurice's diary. The diary doesn't cover his entire life. It mainly describes his efforts on his journey to Everest. The idea that Maurice became empathetic, charitable, and interested in inspiring others didn't come from his time in the army, 
or strike him as a revelation while in the trenches of France, Maurice came from a hard-working and charitable family. Maurice's father, Mark, was a skilled businessman and worked his way up the corporate ladder. I'm not really sure they had corporate ladders in the early 1900s, but if they did, Maurice's father, Mark, was climbing one. At a fairly young age, Mark Wilson became a director at the Home Top Mill in Little Horton, which is now part of the city of Bradford. Bradford sits about an hour northeast of Manchester and about an hour directly north of the Peak District, what is now the Peak District National Park. Peak District National Park has always been a training ground for mountaineers and climbers. People started climbing in the Peak District in the 1880s, and the first guidebook listing the climbs of the Peak District was published in about 1913. So Maurice grew up in an area where mountaineering and climbing was a popular activity for some, but it hadn't been his. It was never his area of interest, not until he decided to take on this massive goal. The Wilson family had always lived a fairly comfortable life. Mark and his wife Sarah and their four boys were doing quite well, and as Mark's success offered them opportunities to move out of the middle class and up into the luxury class, but Mark was very uncomfortable with the luxury class, and he ultimately gave away much of his money. He was very aware of deserving local causes, and the Wilson family became very well known for their charitable works. Maurice showed from an early age an aptitude for business, and he followed his father into the family business, beginning his apprenticeship at age 14. But more importantly than business, Maurice also inherited empathy and an understanding of those who were less fortunate than himself. Bradford, at the turn of the 20th century, was an impoverished city. Mark had no desire to hide the poverty and unhappier side of life from the eyes of his sons. Maurice developed an affection and empathy for the world's underdogs, a feeling that he never really lost. Years later, it was that feeling that brought Maurice to the decision to try to inspire the world. People that take extreme risks have been called selfish by putting their goals ahead of health and safety. A common phrase is that those who take risks don't think about their loved ones, or the ones that will be left behind if they get hurt or killed. In Maurice's case, every risk he took was with the thought of others, how people might be inspired by his adventure, and in turn would get out of their own comfort zone and try to make their life move a little forward inspire them to try something new. The grand plan in Maurice's mind would be creating a movement that would have its origins in one man from Bradford doing what no one else has ever done. Maurice may have been the most unselfish adventurer of his or any other time, but Maurice was no easygoing pushover either. He was determined, perhaps too determined for his own good. He certainly put his dreams of inspiring others ahead of his own safety and arguably never considered the thoughts and feelings of people close to him. For Maurice, his mission was for the faceless masses out in the world. And he believed his mission was ordained and protected by his beliefs and his faith. I assume you're listening to this podcast because you enjoy a good adventure story. Along with the High Adventure podcast, Accidental Productions has produced a number of films in the web series El Cap Bridge, which features discussions with famous and not-so-famous climbers that hang out in what's called the center of the climbing universe. Our feature film, Assault in El Capitan, takes you up on the second ascent of Wings of Steel with legendary big wall climber Emmett McNeely as he tries to solve the mystery of the most controversial climb in Yosemite history. A climb that involved lies and deception and even attempted murder. Assault on El Capitan is available on streaming services and platforms everywhere and is free on Amazon Prime. Now back to our story. In May of 1934, a cloud of powder snow was streaming off the north face of Everest. The freezing temperatures at 21,000 feet were numbing, both physically and mentally. Pitched a little below the North Call, 
A tiny tent contained three men, locked in a debate that quickly was moving into an argument. The wind whipped and sliced around that small tent with the violence that only Everest can manifest. Inside the tent, two Sherpas were forced to shout so their voices could be heard over the roaring winds that were slamming against the thin canvas that separated them from certain death. The Sherpas were born and had grown up in these mountains. They were raised with a notable respect for the mountains and the dangers of the Himalaya. But the third man in the tent, the Yorkshireman, was determined to push on. If he himself had doubts about his success and survival, he didn't share them with the Sherpas. Their camp sat perched 8,000 feet below the summit. They argued long into the night. The argument was settled, as it usually is, with the person paying the bills getting their way, at least partially. The argument ended with Maurice telling his far more experienced mountain guides, quote, Wait here for ten days. Then if I don't come back, return to the village yourselves. Think about that for a second. Freezing temperatures. Wind blowing the way only Himalayan winds can blow. Telling the only people with any experience to wait. And then to go off alone. It all sounds like an officer leading men into a suicide attack in a battle. But that wasn't unique to Maurice Wilson's mind. He'd done this same thing several times during battles in World War I. But at that moment, at 21,000 feet, and so close to success, taking a walk on the snowy, windswept slopes of Everest probably didn't seem like much of a risk, and certainly not when compared to the reward that he would personally receive knowing that he'd inspired people around the world. Maurice was educated at the Carlton Road Secondary School, and records show that he was a bright but not an exceptional student. Physically, he was strong, and he had what an early biographer called an independent heir, whatever that means. It, it might be the underlying trait that attracts me to the podcast stories I tell and to the subjects of some of my films. It might be an independent heir that is indefinable, a trait that many judge and criticize in others, but what we all secretly wish we had. It's that that air of confidence that stops just short of arrogance. Or maybe it's just that who gives a rip mentality. I'll do what I want attitude that's egotistical enough to think that whatever they do will inspire others out of their sheer admiration. That seems counter to the way Maurice was raised and the way he spoke of inspiring people. But without a forensic psychological assessment, it's all pretty much just speculation at this point. An area that's without question was Maurice's aptitude for languages. By the age of 12, Maurice was fluent in both French and German, and he could speak in either language with virtually no trace of his Yorkshire accent. The ability to pick up languages would become very valuable on his journey through the Himalaya. In episode one, we discussed Maurice's experience in World War I and his military history. And after the war, Maurice returned to Bradford and went back to work in the family textile business. But things weren't the same. He was restless. He felt unsettled and he was generally unhappy. Most likely a victim of PTSD, but emotional injuries were decades from being acknowledged and understood, not to mention accepted. While others who returned after the war settled down in a few weeks or months or into some sort of existence, it took Maurice Wilson over a decade to find his place and a purpose in the world. In the years following his return from the war, Maurice developed into a a perfectionist. Maybe the regimented life in the military or maybe reliving mistakes that in the war cost him the use of his arm and ultimately parts of his mind. Does our mind re-engineer our mistakes and experiences into lessons that we think we can later perfect? Whatever the reason for this new trait in his personality, it became real. And there is a saying that to be a perfectionist is to hate life. 
Though Maurice didn't seem to hate life when he returned to Bradford, he just found it all so mundane. So he did what he thought would bring him joy. He got married. In 1922, at the age of 24, Maurice married 22-year-old Beatrice Hardy Slater. The wedding bells didn't bring the happiness that Maurice had hoped. After a few months, Maurice decided that life and prospects would be better in London. The London experience lasted 18 months, and like many war veterans of the time, Maurice decided to emigrate. First stop, New York City, where he spent several months. Maurice went through a series of jobs, and with his business background and abilities, he was successful at all of them. But none seemed to hold his interest for very long. He left New York after a few months with nothing more than a few new slang words added to his already very impressive vocabulary. From New York, he crossed the continent to San Francisco, but instead of seeing the Golden Gate as an entry to a dream, he saw it as an exit to something more. Maurice was not looking for contentment. He was seeking true happiness. Not an uncommon human desire, but certainly not one that's often chased to the ends of the earth by most people. A lot of people find contentment and find a way to create happiness. Maurice seemed to think that happiness should be organic and to be experienced rather than simply a a state of mind. When happiness wasn't found in Bradford, London, New York, or San Francisco, Maurice crossed the South Pacific and landed in New Zealand. He seemed determined to make New Zealand a home, and it seemed to be a place he was finding happiness. Maurice worked as a traveling salesman for a time, and he was given a recipe for a kind of a snake oil type miracle elixir that he manufactured, bottled, and sold. It might seem a little out of character, but to me it fits perfectly in his quest to find happiness and spread hope to those less fortunate. He next tried farming, where his energy and business skills brought him a lot of financial success, but after 18 months, farming bored him. So he moved to Wellington on the southwest tip of the North Island. Finding his way to Wellington is not surprising for a couple reasons. One, it's one of the most populous areas of New Zealand. So opportunities would exist when looking for a way to make a living. But secondly, and maybe more importantly, Wellington is at the end and on the edge of an island. It seems no matter where you go, the end and edge of any continent attracts people of a more adventurous nature and also large groups of seekers. People are looking to make changes and maybe looking for a place to start over and some are just running and ran out of places to run too. If you go to any coastal town or the edge of any vast area, you'll find folks who march to their own drummer, people who see things slightly different than the mainstream. These are the adventurers, the abstract thinkers, the searchers, and many would say the lost, but some might say the found. After searching around Wellington for an opportunity that might hold his interest, Maurice somewhat came back to his roots. Though seemingly a mundane business, Maurice bought a small ladies' dress shop. Using the business skills and experience from the textile mill in Bradford, Maurice became very successful. But his home life and marriage was falling apart. His marriage to Beatrice ended in divorce in 1926. But four days after his divorce, Maurice married Ruby Russell, a Wellington woman who was originally from Tasmania. Now, I've read a few reports that Maurice was a misogynist and Maybe that contributed to the collapse of his marriages. It's curious that I also couldn't find any information confirming that Maurice brought Beatrice to America and then on to New Zealand. It's likely Maurice left Beatrice in England when he emigrated, and it seems he left Ruby in New Zealand when he returned to England. Either way, once again Maurice became bored and restless and decided to catch the mail boat back to England. Now there's no doubt he would have been welcomed home to Bradford by his mother and brothers, but When he returned to England, he went straight to London to live and work. In a 2016 article, the Australian online magazine The Quadrant reported that Maurice was a transvestite. That speculation is fueled by the report that women's underwear was found in Maurice's rucksack and a woman's shoe was found near Maurice's Everest camp location. If true, Maurice might have been the first transvestite to attempt to climb Everest. There's a lot of speculation there both that Maurice was a transvestite 
and that he was the first transvestite to attempt an Everest ascent. We'll look at that a little later in the story. Maurice Wilson was fortunate in some ways. His talent for business enabled him to hold good jobs and run successful businesses. Money was never an obstacle for Maurice. He always seemed to be able to do what he wanted, when he wanted. And after selling his very successful dress shop and setting sail on the mailboat to England, Maurice found himself looking out over the clear blue waters beyond the Great Barrier Reef and taking a stock of his life. He decided that even through his accomplishments as a soldier and a businessman, he was neither a success nor a failure. But now, into his 30s, he felt he was approaching a crossroads that would lead him to either success or failure. Looking around the ship at his fellow passengers, Maurice saw men and women who had wasted opportunities and others who had wasted or lacked riches and even worse, lacked ideas. He also found that those around him without wealth were in his mind much friendlier and made for better company than those fellow passengers who had wealth and status. The lessons from his father were always at the forefront of his consciousness. He wrote in his diary, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, and I am more at ease with them than at the tables of the high and mighty. The failures and misfits in life were the ones he felt most comfortable with. Never judging a person by economic status or station in life, Maurice held empathy and compassion. Though a paradox in his personal life with the people he was close to, by all accounts he was not a good husband and was not particularly kind to his wives and he disregarded family and friends who would often reach out when he seemed to need help himself. At a stop in Bombay, Several Indian men boarded the ship. Maurice learned that they were yogis, and he became interested in their self-denial and self-discipline. He was fascinated with their explanations of being able to endure extreme physical ordeals without any real physical harm. The conversations and lessons seemingly did not have a long-lasting impact on Maurice, but as his life unfolded, it's clear he consciously or unconsciously took on some of the challenges that the yogis practice daily. Once in London, he hoped for a new and contented life as he'd been seeking around the world. Though he knew many good and influential people from his family connections and his own business success, Maurice's difficult personality made it hard for him to form close relationships. Again, this is a guy who suffered unspeakable horrors during World War I. Much of the difficulty he seemed to have socially as an adult was not evident when he was growing up. As a kid, he was happy and well-adjusted, and by all accounts, a likable young man who was full of potential. But at 18, he witnessed the unspeakable horrors of the war. And what came out was a difficult, troubled, and irreparably damaged man that had a hard time relating to people. He wasn't the first to have his life altered by what he witnessed as a teenager. Back in London, he developed an interesting and curious relationship with a couple named Leonard and Enid Evans. They became very close. They met when Maurice was buying a car and Leonard was the salesman at the local dealership. Leonard was quiet and restrained, but quickly took a liking to Maurice and insisted that Maurice come home with him to meet his pretty and vivacious young wife. The Evans were described as a young, happily married couple in love with each other and in love with life. Does that seem strange? Do car salesmen and customers usually become so friendly during a transaction that the salesman wants to bring the customer home to meet his pretty wife? Every source I found made a point to refer to how pretty and vivacious Enid was. None of the sources I found indicate specifically that the relationship between the three was more than platonic. One source called the relationship innocent, but another referred to it as affectionate. The three were obviously close, but how close? We'll most likely never know. Completely innocent, or maybe a little more adventurous. I think wherever your mind takes you about what their relationship was could be accurate. We were coming out of the Roaring Twenties where the young and well-off lived lives that are not always spoken of out loud. The social interactions with the Evans couple were helpful to Maurice for a while, but his demons began to creep back in. 
He wondered if he would ever find happiness and if he would ever find the perfection that he was sure would provide that happiness. Leonard and Enid stayed up late into the night talking with Maurice, and according to one account, the couple became so fond of him and they regarded him as a well-loved brother. Using the term well-loved when describing their feelings towards Maurice could be code or it could be a harmless term of endearment. Either way, if you add this element to the possibility that Maurice was a cross-dresser, it makes his personal life close to as interesting as his dreams were. A few months after returning to London from New Zealand, Maurice's health began to deteriorate. He lost a lot of weight and developed a hacking cough and that seemed uncontrollable. It appeared that, along with deep depression, tuberculosis had taken a hold. One day, he left a note for Leonard and Edith that read, I must shake this thing off. If I come back, you'll know that I'm all right. If you don't see me again, you'll know that I'm dead. Maurice then disappeared. As we discussed in episode one, Maurice met a self-described mystic. Where he met this man and who exactly he was remains a mystery. Maurice in all his writings never revealed the man's name, but the man's story convinced Maurice to put his health and life into this man's hands. The man told the story of 17 years before, when he'd been given three months to live, and he'd discovered a miracle cure. He was seemingly convinced and had convinced others that he was now the holder of this miracle cure. The man listed on his resume of successes as having cured people of arthritis, diabetes, tuberculosis, venereal disease, and even cancer. He promised his cure was 100% effective, and was even endorsed by several doctors. Now, that's unlikely, but to a depressed and desperately ill man, it seemed believable. The man told Maurice that after he'd been cured, he'd made it his life's mission to help others. He relayed all these stories from a luxury apartment in an upper-class area of London. So though he was offering a miracle cure, it wasn't free. Maurice is a man of modest wealth from the sale of his dress shop in New Zealand, no doubt contributed to this mystery man's own wealth. The cure, as it turns out, was a simple one, and consisted of only two things, fasting and faith. Maurice retreated into his apartment, only to come out 35 days later with a new perspective. To complete his transformation, he set off for the Black Forest of southwest Germany. In the next episode, we'll discuss Maurice's preparation and the start of his journey to Everest. Facing extreme hardship and even death on every leg of the journey, he also had to outmaneuver the British government who were doing everything in their power to stop him from going on what they and others considered to be a suicide mission. Say hang you for all my sins